Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Monday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And like I said, this is my Morning Musings. I, uh, I'm always at the office early, uh, somewhere around 4 o'clock, and enjoy wonderful coffee uh, for the little bit. <clears throat> Pardon me. As I share my thoughts with you, each morning, Monday through Thursday, very often on Fridays as well. And I want to thank you so very, very much for joining me and sharing in these thoughts with me. Okay, well, uh, I need to give a little bit of an update on my health situation. As many of you know, I had a medical procedure about two weeks ago. They found a growth uh, in my urinary system and uh, the doctor said it looked really unusual. The good news is he didn't, he did not seem to think that it had the look of any cancer. We are waiting on the pathology report. And as a matter of fact, I go back to the doctor tomorrow, <clears throat> pardon me, to receive the pathology report. Uh, please keep that in your prayers and your thoughts. And let me express again how much of, I appreciate all of the prayers and the thoughts that have been expressed for my well-being. I, I, I really, really do appreciate that. Well, we want to continue our study of the Olivet Discourse. And we have been focusing on Matthew chapter 25 and the parable of the coming of the Lord and the five wise, the five foolish virgins. And the reason that I'm spending so much time on this parable is that if you will remember the great majority of commentators believe that the Olivet Discourse is divided into two subjects. From Matthew 24, 4 to 34, we are told that refers to the Lord's coming, uh, to the events leading up to the fall of Jerusalem and the Lord's coming in AD 70 to destroy the temple and the city. However, it is then assumed literally without a shred of evidence and listen, I once believed this view. I once believed that the Olivet Discourse was divided into two subjects. And that beginning with Matthew 24, verse 36, Jesus introduces, or I should say, addresses the so-called second part of the apostles' questions, where in response to Jesus' prediction, and remember this, they were responding to Jesus' prediction of the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. And in direct response to that prediction, they said, tell us, when shall these things, what things? Fall of Jerusalem, destruction of the temple. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now the commentators come to those questions. And they say, well, you know, the apostles were so confused. They were wrong. They believed that the temple could not be destroyed, would not be destroyed, unless it was at the end of the Christian age. Now, I've got to tell you something. I've written a book on this entire issue entitled, Watching for the Parousia, were Jesus' apostles confused? And over the weekend, <clears throat> while I was in Arkansas visiting my grandkids, I received an, a couple of emails forwarding a couple of articles to me from Kenneth Gentry. Well, it appears that someone sent Mr. Gentry my book, Watching for the Parousia, Were Jesus' Apostles Confused? Obviously, this book has deeply, deeply disturbed Mr. Gentry. <coughs> Pardon me. And so, in two articles, so far, he promises four, he enters into what can only be described as a diatribe. And the first two articles are almost have almost nothing whatsoever to say doctrinally. They attack my journalistic style, my, quote, attitudinal pro uh, problem, unquote, and other issues. 
And by the way, I'm in the process now of responding to Mr. Gentry's two articles. They will be posted on my website. I'm thinking seriously about doing an audio or a video series responding to Mr. Gentry's articles. But nonetheless, you need to know that Mr. Gentry <clears throat> is one of those commentators who divide the Olivet Discourse into destruction of Jerusalem, end of the world. And Mr. Gentry believes that Matthew 25, 1 to 13, predicts the coming of the Lord at the end of the Christian age. What he sometimes refers to as the end of human history. <clears throat> so, you might be watching for that. I had, I had some plans for my uh, Friday responding to the critics section, and I won't be doing that for two more weeks, but nonetheless, <clears throat> since Mr. Gentry has taken so much umbrage and, you know, literally attacked my journalistic style, and I'll, I'll share what I mean by that in the videos, then I'm going to respond to his articles on my Friday responding to the critics section. And I, I think you are going to be absolutely amazed at, at how utterly feeble <clears throat> Mr. Gentry's, quote, response to my book is. And, of course, when I make that res uh, response, I'm going to be offering my new book, Watching for the Parousia, Were Jesus' Apostles Confused? I'm going to be offering that a really, really, really great special price so that you can have in your hands the very book, <coughs> pardon me, that Mr. Gentry thinks is so horrible. Now, I can tell you in the first two articles that he has produ produced, and remember, I understand they have not been doctrinally oriented, but I think you're going to be amazed at the language and the, uh, may I use the term, attitudinal problem unquote, exhibited by Mr. Kenneth Gentry. So, be looking for that in a couple of weeks, all right? That means we're going to be getting into the holiday season and all that kind of stuff like that. So, uh, I, I may work around the holiday season, but nonetheless, it's coming, so be watching for it. So, all right, taking up a lot of time this morning. Uh, <clears throat> let me just say, I hope you had a fantastic weekend. Hope you were safe. As I mentioned, I got to go to Arkansas, my wife and I did, uh, to visit her grandkids, went to my grandson's football game in the driving rain, terrible wind, horrible cold, and he got in the game for two plays, but we got to see it. <laughs> All right. Now, re <clears throat> remember, I am focused on the wedding motif of Matthew 25. And here's the reason why. When commentators divide Matthew 25, Matthew, or the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 25, 1 to 13 is one of those passages coming obviously after Matthew 24, 36, that they posit as the end of the world, the end of time, the end of the current Christian age. <clears throat> if therefore, it is demonstrated that the wedding, which takes place at the coming of the Lord, Matthew 25, 1 to 13, if, if it is demonstrated that that wedding took place in the first century at the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, then all attempts to divide the Olivet Discourse are completely and totally falsified. That means that Mr. Kenneth Gentry's supposedly upcoming book to demonstrate the division of, Ma of the Olivet Discourse is falsified before it ever reaches the press. That's how important this study is. When you realize that 95%, 98%, 99% of commentators divide the Olivet Discourse and that the wedding of the parable, a uh, wedding of the the wedding parable, it's a Monday morning, the wedding parable lies at the foundation of that claim of a divided discourse, then you can see 
and better understand why I am spending so much time in demonstrating to you, number one, number one, the wedding motif and the wedding promise, that is, the wedding at the coming of the Lord was an old covenant promise made to old covenant Israel. <clears throat> it is not a new covenant promise divorced from Israel. Listen, I was raised believing that God was through with Israel at the cross. And all that God did was divorce Israel, more specifically Judah, at the cross. And therefore, he then betrothed the church. And it's the church having nothing whatsoever to do with Israel that takes place at the second coming. Folks, nothing could be more erroneous. Now, I've already talked for a good bit. Here we are Monday morning, and I had a lot to say. So i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to just use this as an introduction to where we're going next in our study. And that's Isaiah chapter 54. And again, I understand that I'm, I'm examining an awful lot of Old Covenant passages that have to do with the, God's promise to Old Covenant Israel. In the first instance, the ten northern tribes married to Israel. They became an unfaithful, harlot, adulterous wife. God divorced her. He could not divorce the two southern tribes because Messiah had not yet come. But God promised that in the last days, Hosea 3, verses 3 to 5, He would return and Israel would worship David their king. And, pardon me, at that time, God would make a new covenant which is the new marriage covenant with the whole house of Israel, Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, we're going to look at Isaiah 54 tomorrow on the flip side. So your assignment, your homework is to read the entirety of Isaiah 54. Look at those key motival elements that are repeated in Jeremiah 31, that are repeated in Ezekiel 37, that are repeated in Ezekiel chapter 34, and, and that are quoted, cited, and echoed in the New Testament where the apostles of Jesus Christ apply Isaiah 54 with its promise of the remarriage, with its promise of the new covenant, with the promise of the restoration of Israel, with the promise, leading into chapter 55, of the calling of the nations, nations plural, into the household of God. Okay? So, uh, I, I sort of kind of apologize for taking up all the time this morning for introductory matters, but do your homework, read Isaiah 54, and I'll see you on the flip side.